Hello, everyone. It's 1 p.m. Eastern, and that means it's time to begin another Coco Ross Weather Talk webinar. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us today. I'm your host, meteorologist Henry Regis. Running the technical side of our program is our very own Noah Newman. We're coming to you live from sunny yet smoky Fort Collins, Colorado. For those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we're recording today's talk and it will be available later this week on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by the generous donations of listeners just like you. Well, today's webinar, webinar, webinar is about derechos, and that's a, that's a tough one to pronounce, almost as tough as the, the word kokoros for a lot of people uh, when they see the spelling on that. Uh, these are nature's walls of wind, one of our most, uh, one of those weather phenomena that many of you probably have not heard of before, but in several parts of the country and, and the world for that matter, they may experience these from time to time. Perhaps you've uh, had one come through your area. Our guest today is Walker Ashley from Northern Illinois University. Walker is an atmospheric scientist and disaster geographer with interest in extreme weather and societal impacts. His research examines hazardous weather phenomena their societal impacts, and how disasters will change in the 21st century. Walker grew up in the Atlanta metro area and also lived in the small town of White Plains, Georgia. He holds a bachelor's and PhD from the University of Georgia, where he is an avid Bulldogs football fan, and a master's from the University of Nebraska. One of his favorite pastimes is storm chasing, where he's on the road several times a year hunting down tornadoes. Well, let's give a big warm Kokoros welcome to Walker. Walker, great to have you with us today. Uh, we would like to, as we start off the program, we usually pose this question to most of our guests and, and that's uh, how did you become interested in weather? Well, first off, thanks Henry and uh, thanks Noah for uh, working on the technical aspects of this. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question and a lot of meteorologists often point back to a singular event that uh, happened in their childhood. Uh, the way I'll frame it is that I was a, a child of the 1980s and um, although we think of CNN and news uh, 24 hours uh, growing out of the 1980s, the other thing that grew out of the 1980s was the Weather Channel. And I was an avid uh, viewer of the Weather Channel and spent uh, a lot of time staring at the local on the eights, as well as uh, uh, the 20 minutes after the hour, they used to have the extended range forecast. And as a, a kid in the, in the deep south, um, I was always looking for, for that clip of snow to come down and give us a snowstorm. Very rare, but I was always looking out in the extended for that. So. It wasn't until the 90s that I kind of solidified my interest in meteorology with a with a F4 tornado that went through my father's uh, farming community of White Plains, Georgia, a killer tornado. And uh, seeing the destruction, the aftermath of that was uh, really um, the smells of the pine. And it just it was, it was a remarkable event, sensory overload. And so happens to be that my mother's house was hit in Atlanta in 1998. Um, so I've had a lot of close calls uh, from, from killer tornadoes and uh, have always been fascinated by the weather and just uh, uh, love every aspect of it. When you, when you go out chasing, have you, have you had any close encounters out there? You know, I mean, yeah, you have close encounters. If you're going to be playing around with uh, Mother Nature, um, you, even the most experienced people, as we know, uh, most experienced storm chasers, uh, Tim Samaras, uh, you know, um, was impacted by a tornado, the El Reno event. Um, you have close calls. I'm a relatively conservative chaser by today's standards. Um, I much prefer a wide angle view and I like a lot of time lapse. So I tend to get the uh, uh, structure shots is kind of what I am a structure chaser, um, which tends to prevent me from getting a little too close. But um, you know, your the road networks and uh, um, too much traffic can sometimes get you in a little bit of trouble, though. Well, well, thanks for sharing that information with us. We really appreciate that introduction. Uh, we're going to hand it over to you now for the presentation. And uh, again, we'll let, we'll come back when you're finished with questions from our audience. All right, uh, Noah, can you confirm that you can see my PowerPoint or Henry? Uh, yeah, there, yes. we are on. Okay, okay good. good deal. 
Well, again, thank you, Henry, for the invitation and Noah for, for making sure everything works here. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll make it through this without any hiccups and internet dropping out. But um, um, I'm going to talk to you about derechos, which is a, an aspect of my research I spent my graduate career studying. Although I'm going to turn back to it here shortly because we're going to be interested in the aspects of, of whether derechos and their climatology and their intensity may change in a, a climate change regime. So I, I debated about what to call, you know, uh, uh, what nature's wall of wind. Some people call these land decanes or hurricanes over the land. And you've got to be careful with terminology and, and conflating two different things. Hurricanes are a vastly different sort of experience and they form dynamically different uh, than what we than we'd expect with derecho. So you got to be careful. But the impacts to humans can be equivalent to category one to three hurricanes. So it, it, it makes sense that some people conflate the two uh, phenomena. Um, here you can actually see a shelf cloud, uh, one of the appearances of, of many derechos uh, out ahead of it. Um, this case, we're looking out over the campus of Northern Illinois University and an impending uh, shelf cloud affiliated with the, um, the outflow of a big thunderstorm complex. So today I'm going to talk, I love history. I'm a, 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 all of my students in my classes, no matter how dynamically or, or physically, uh, you know, uh, the nuts and bolts of the course are. I always like for the students to make sure they understand the history of, of the phenomena that they're studying. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of, of how we came about with the term derecho. We'll look at some of the definitions. We'll look at types of derechos and of course the climatology, which is something I'm, I'm very interested in in the changing climatology, particularly with some of these events. I'll pull out one case that you're seeing over here to the right that's illustrated what we call the sandwich satellite view, which is a combination of both visible satellite as well as infrared, um, a very cool tool that you can get with the new Go, Go satellites up there. And uh, also are the blue circles there indicating the wind reports, um, as well as red dots are tornado reports and green dots are hail reports. So you can see this very expansive derecho event that occurred. Uh, primarily the worst of the impacts were in Iowa and Northern Illinois, but a uh, really remarkable case we'll talk about. And then we'll, we'll look into peer into the future and see if these things may be changing. So let's take a step back and look at just the thunderstorm. Um, out of World War II, um, you know, we had some leftover radars. We had obviously servicemen that we could uh, uh, put into action um, for science. And we had the post-World War II thunderstorm project. And there's a link over the right if you want to learn a little bit more about this, this particular study. But uh, the, the, the book that came out of this, The Thunderstorm by Byers and Bram in 1949, really described, it's the foundational material uh, in our understanding of thunderstorms still to this day. We learned that the cell, what we call a thunderstorm cell, is kind of the basic organizational structure of, of thunderstorms. We knew at that point that downdrafts were very important, obviously have concerns for aviation, as we'll see here in just a second. And when they also recognized that gusty surface winds we're affiliated with this outflow. And we've all probably have experienced thunderstorms and the, and the cool outflow that occurs with these storms. The intensity of the outflow uh, is ultimately what we're gonna kind of hone in on today. And that will uh, determine whether or not we have a storm that may, meets these derecho criteria. So you can Ex see some of the- I'm so sorry, Walker. Um, yep. Your screen is, uh, se it seems quite pixelated um, from um, our view. I'm not sure. If it's let's try it again. Yeah, let's give it another shot and see what's happening here. Thank you. Sorry about that. Is that better? Let's see. Still standing by. Okay. Let me try it again. How about now? Yes, that is better. Well, that is bizarre. I don't know why it would have been pixelated, um, but please yell at me again if it is uh, pixelated. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, weird, weird, weird. I should be on pretty good internet, but we know how these things go. Walker, so, would you mind going back a slide just so we have that on the, the broadcast for those who are... Sure. It might be the size of this image creating the pixelated... Uh, yeah, no, you're, you're nice and clear now. So there we go. <laughs> we're, we're looking good. Okay. Bizarre. And unfortunately, probably my image is not pixelated, my, my personal image, but... Uh, yeah, uh, which, no, we're good. We're good to go. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So you can see that sandwich satellite. We'll talk about this case in a lot more depth here shortly. Um, so there is some imagery from the book indicating kind of the 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 the, the, the two dimensional nature of of these cells slicing through the developing stage, the mature stage, 
and ultimately the dissipating stage. We still, in our introductory level classes, still use kind of the nuts and bolts that we got from, from the Byers and Bram study of the late 1940s. But let's skip ahead a few decades. And it wasn't until this really the 60s, but certainly the 70s, where we started to have uh, commercial aircraft fall from the sky. And in particular, this Eastern Airlines flight um, that crashed uh, near JFK in 1975 spurred a revolution in our understanding of downbursts and ultimately microbursts and macrobursts and the derecho terminology that we know these days. That science was led by Ted Fujita. I know Ted Fujita is very famous for his tornado uh, intensity or damage scale. Most of us have heard of Ted Fujita. Ted Fujita's probably biggest contribution was in the realm of downbursts and our understanding of this. He was tacked uh, uh, to, to study these events and try to figure out what was causing these aircraft to fall from the sky. So he kind of pushed the envelope of our understanding of these events. Um, and what he noticed during his survey of the April 3rd, 1974 super outbreak, which is namely known for its tornadoes, his post-event surveys of, of literally every path on, on this devastating day, he noticed other types of damage patterns that he used and deduced a couple of years later after the uh, Eastern Airlines that, that had very similar sort of damage um, streaks that he was seeing uh, back in 1974. And so he went further and, and, and over the next decade or so, um, really led uh, the forefront of our understanding of something called a downburst. Um, and he actually subdivided that by intensity further on to a microburst and ultimately a macroburst. And so one of my prized possessions is Ted Fujita's books on not only the downburst, but also tornadoes. I have them in my library in my office. If you're interested in learning about the history of Ted Fujita, there was a, a great American Experience documentary put out in PBS just a couple of years, maybe about a year or two ago. And there is the link down at the bottom for you. So to show you some of the amazing work that he did, here's an example of, of not only tornado paths in red, but some of the microbursts and damage paths that he highlighted across uh, central Illinois in this particular case uh, back in 1978. There was also a big long swath of damaging wind. Um, uh, this one over 166 miles long, miles long uh, upwards of 17 miles wide, a so-called Independence Day. Uh, downburst that occurred in northern Wisconsin. So he has a litany of these sorts of events that he did post event assessments on and uh, learned a lot. Um, he, he just had an amazing ability to take relatively uh, coarse information and, and do these amazingly detailed uh, uh, post event assessments. So to differentiate, and this is very hard, you got to remember when we're doing assessments of, of damaging wind patterns, um, very, it's very unlikely that we have any sort of aerial view. Now, drones are changing the, the, the kind of the, the visibility of that, and that's a nice tool, but not every weather service office has a drone or drone capabilities. But here you can actually see trees laying on top of each other, and this is kind of a telltale sign of potentially tornadic damage. Also kind of almost in the bottom right, you can see a cyclic sort of a, a, a kind of rotating view to the trees, and this is a, an indication of tornadic damage. Now, compare that with microburst damage. Same sort of forest and, and you notice nearby you kind of got this, this splashing out effect and, and microburst damage has this sort of diverging or kind of straight appearance to it. So damaging winds from, from thunderstorms are actually far more common than tornadoes and many people who think that the tree was felled because of a tornado were actually are incorrect. Most of the damage that we see um, out there and actually the, the, the dominant mode of severe weather in the United States is actually damaging wind. Um, but it's very, very difficult as an observer, whether it be the weather service or, or an engineer going out there, sometimes to try to differentiate between damaging winds and tornadic wind, um, especially when you don't have a tracer like a series of trees. Uh, it's very hard, particularly during uh, the winter and, and cool season when you don't have things in the fields, particularly around here in the Midwest where we, the, the ground is fallow and uh, uh, finding damage indicators can be very difficult. So the downburst itself is, is, is defined as this strong thunderstorm downdraft that originates in the mid to lower parts. Now, typically in the higher plains, it might be further above the ground, the origination area, uh, but in the Southeast, it might be closer to, to the ground, but it's in the mid to lower part of the thunderstorm and it descends to the ground 
where it spreads out. And I liken it to a water balloon. You fill up a water balloon and drop it on the concrete. It splashes out. That's exactly what's happening with these very intense downbursts. The winds can exceed 100. We have measured gusts uh, well in, into the 170s. And these can cause damage equivalent to, to EF2s or greater. Um, Ted Fujita defined these uh, uh, by their intensity and their, their width. Uh, he called them microbursts for relatively small events of less than 2.5 miles. And then macrobursts for those much larger events um, um, that actually derechos tend to have a lot of. We can Walker, usually- a quick, a quick question on that yep. wet microburst. Would that be, would there be a lot of water coming down with that as well? So kind of like a water balloon dropping or just wind? So microburst, there's actually a spectrum of microbursts. Um, you go from what we call the dry microburst, which actually out in Fort Collins and in the High Plains, you get, get a number of them, uh, to the wet microburst, which typify the Ohio Valley in the Southeast, where you know it's, it, it's almost like being in a washing machine. Okay. Um, so, and of course, there's all, all sorts of things in between. Um, but the climatology of dry tends to be uh, much further out into the West where you have higher cloud bases. Um, and in the Southeast, you tend to get the wetter microbursts. Um, so it, it just varies it, it, and a great question. Um, here, you can actually see a couple of examples because we visually can see these in the desert Southwest. Uh, a couple from Storm Chasers showing you uh, microbursts descending to the ground and splashing out. Now, you don't always, it's, it's like tornadoes. You don't always see tornadoes. They can be wrapped in rain and microbursts can be wrapped in rain and you might not see the actual descending of these, of these microbursts. These are just a couple of time-lapse cases. Perhaps the most dramatic was, it was taught, uh, uh, caught by this uh, photographer. Just, you know, Ap apocalyptic sort of microbursts, a series of microbursts descending here in the desert southwest, uh, showing you just a remarkable, this is the sort of stuff that a, that a storm chaser lives for. I know that you think that we do nothing but chase tornadoes, but I love cloudscapes like this, and this is just a remarkable image showing you cold, dense air sinking to the ground and splashing out much like a water balloon. So, Let's skip ahead a little bit further and Ted Fujita and his graduate student at the time, uh, Wakimoto, who is now, by the way, uh, I think he's the vice president for uh, or vice provost for research at UCLA. Um, but Fujita and Wakimoto did this kind of, you know, after they had cataloged all of these events over, over many years, created this kind of scale of downburst winds. And we start down at the bottom of the graph with relatively small events. This might be a, a wind event that just knocks down a tree in your backyard or knocks down a power pole, you know, down a road. Very small event, maybe on the order of hundred meters, you know, football field size. You move up to the microburst, which might be on the order of a kilometer or so, uh, about a half a mile. And then we move up to the downburst, which is usually, we're talking a little bit longer. And then the cluster, and then finally, the biggest of them all, which is this family of downburst clusters, which according to Ted Fujita was roughly about a thousand kilometers long. We're going to use that, as you'll see here, this family of downburst clusters definition that Fujita and Wakimoto came up with to ultimately define derechos. But before we define derecho, let's, let's take a step back and talk about storm morphology, storm type, because ultimately the type of storm you get oftentimes determines the severe weather that you're gonna get. If you get something called a supercell, which I'm sure many of the listeners out there are familiar with that terminology, your chances of, of, of a tornado and hail are far greater. If you get something called a linear convective system or maybe a bow echo, um, that is more likely to produce damaging winds. So one of the things that forecasters struggle with is predicting storm mode. And this is something that we're working, working, working with here uh, at NIU. We're trying to get better at predicting in the medium range. So days three through eight, can we improve our skill at determining storm morphology or storm type, the dominant mode of storm that we're going to get? If we can do that, we can get better accuracy with our, with our, our forecasts. It, we can say, oh, it's going to be a damaging wind day or it's going to be a tornado day. And the more information that we can get out, particularly in that medium to long range, is, is going to be helpful for people that are trying to mitigate these events. What I'm showing you here is one of my favorite captures is a supercell. As I told Henry, I'm a much more of a structure guy. 
I'm not up and underneath these things that often. I much like the, the, the whole view of the storm. Um, and this is an, a great example of a supercell. So there are cells. Remember the Byers and Bram talked about how they developed cells as kind of the basic building block of, of storms. Um, so think of it as a bi when you're in biology class, you, you examine cells. Um, oftentimes it was, uh, you know, from the insides of our mouths, we took a little swab and we could look at the skin cells, or maybe it was a potato uh, cell. You know, the same sort of kind of, let's call it size, if you will, of these cells we think of uh, in meteorology. So we start with these relatively small events that are the individual updrafts and downdrafts. We call those cells and then they grow upscale, not always, but they can grow upscale into what we call systems. Some of you may know the terminology mesoscale convective systems or convective systems or thunderstorm system. That's particularly the type of storm that we're interested in when we're trying to forecast derechos. So I, this is a complicated graph, but it's actually trying to reveal sort of the spectrums of storm types that we can get out there. So there's this- I'm gonna interrupt you again. Yep. It looks like your screen went back to the blockiness. Ugh. So maybe after you ran that, whatever you ran, the last two screens there, uh, people are in, unable to see what you've written. Oh, so there we go. We better now? So yeah, I'll, I'll let you know from time to time if it does that. And uh, it's again, something sorry. about that. It's something about the animated GIF that's causing yeah, it. Sorry to interrupt you. Yep, no worries. So. Um, so we have the cellular convection across the top, and you can think of this all the way on the left as kind of your popcorn or air mass thunderstorm, much like we might get in Florida today, just a, goes up and down in about an hour. And then as we get for more and more wind shear in the environment, and remember wind shear is a change in wind direction or speed with height. That's the key ingredient from taking a, a, a regular run of the mill thunderstorm and turning it into a severe thunderstorm. And so as we slide to the right, we get increasing amounts of wind shear in the environment. And that means that our cells become more organized. And once they get something called a mesocyclone, which is a rotating updraft, we, we call them supercells. As I showed you, hopefully it wasn't too pixelated, but I got a few more here, images of supercells. Supercells are the dominant producer of severe weather across the eastern two thirds of the United States. They produce most of the tornadoes, most of the big hail, and even most of the extreme damaging wind events are produced by supercells. But they're relatively small. I liken supercells to peanuts. You know, if you think about a peanut, it's relatively small, but it packs a huge caloric punch. It has a lot of fat and it has a lot of calories and a lot of protein as well. So it's one of those things, if you get deserted on, a, on an island, that would be a great thing to have as a big can of, of, of peanuts. So supercells are real small, but pack a heck of a punch. Now, we, these cells are the building blocks. So if we, we kind of take a bunch of cells, I always, when I talk to my students, I'm thinking, you know, we're all individuals in the classroom, but we're all in this class together right now. There's 30 of us in this classroom, and, and I don't know, and they would have to tell me, but there's well over 100 of us watching this right now but we're all kind of focused in on a very singular topic. And, and you have to think of storms like that. There's individual cells, but they can all be focused in the same area. And when that happens, we turn cells into systems. They grow upscale into what we call convective systems. Again, that convective terminology is just a, when we say thunderstorms, um, we meteorologists often say convection. Now, Thunderstorm systems or convective systems are also um, across a spectrum from very unorganized, what we call aerial, those tend to be flood producers, to the very highly organized linear convective systems. You may know some of the terminology like a squall line or a bow echo or a line echo wave pattern. These linear storms are far more organized and have the, these particular kind um, are the ones that have the, the propensity to produce um, microbursts and macrobursts across large swaths of, of the American West, uh, East. So let me show you a radar perspective. And let's go back to a very famous day, April 27, 2011. And we're looking at the radar depiction across the Mid-South and the Ohio Valley early in the morning. Um, this is before people are waking up. This is uh, the morning of the big outbreak, but we already have severe weather ongoing. In fact, we actually had not only extreme damaging winds in the morning, but also tornadoes across northern Alabama. 
But notice how the thunderstorms are kind of linear all the way from Nashville down towards Jackson, Mississippi. There's a long line of very intense thunderstorms. This is a thunderstorm complex or a system, a mesoscale convective system. Now let's look at just 12 hours later. 12 hours later, the radar depiction now shows supercells. You see the supercells across southern Mississippi and the central and northern Alabama and the eastern Tennessee, much more cellular, pot-marked. These are those peanuts. And by the way, almost every single one of those peanuts is producing a strong or violent tornado at this point. Uh, this day was obviously notorious, killed well over 300 people. You know, we're talking about $10 billion in losses. Uh, you know, if you're from Alabama or Mississippi or, or southern Tennessee, you know all about this event. But it just shows you the difference in storm type, this being primarily damaging wind with some isolated tornadoes, this being predominantly large and violent tornadoes. So the storm type determined your pr primary mode of damaging wind. So let's get more into depth in the terminology. I've mentioned mesoscale convective systems, MCSs, as, as the acronym goes. These are basically just kind of assemblages of thunderstorms that are identified using radar um, reflectivity, uh, which basically is a, you know, a marker of intensity, that persists for at least three hours and contains kind of a, a, a thunderstorm intensity, which by the way, those of you that know radar, usually we're looking at about 40 dBZ or greater for 60 miles uh, uh, along the system's major axis. So these are the definitions, uh, the definition of a mesoscale convective system. I can tell you that we struggle with this. We, we've done a lot of what we call uh, machine learning, um, where we try to classify these events. We try to train a model to identify them. And mother nature resists classification. Um, so while we can give these very stringent definitions, uh, unfortunately, mother nature throws us curveballs all the time. The other type of mesoscale convective system, the, the one that tends to predominate when we, when we talk about derechos, is something called a quasi-linear convective system, a QLCS. And these are nothing more than, than, than mesoscale convective systems that have much more of a, 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 a line along their front end, much like we see right here. This would be a good example of a quasi-linear convective system. So I bring that up because most of our derechos are produced by quasi-linear convective systems. So we spend a lot of time looking out for these events. Um, just because you have a QLCS doesn't mean you'll get a derecho but most derechos are produced by quasi-linear convective systems. If we slice through this, this is actually over on the image on the right here is a, a derecho that occurred back in 2001. I remember chasing this day in Southwest Kansas, expecting to get you know, big tornadoes and whatnot. And all we got was a big squall line coming at us and a lot of damaging winds. The chase ended very, very quickly at a McDonald's as I was getting ice cream. Um, but this is the so-called people chaser derecho. Um, and if we slice through the storm and kind of give it a schematic look, this is what it would look like. You would have your updraft along the front here, your shelf cloud, which we visually have seen an example of. The updraft goes up and then the air exits out the back of the storm in an anvil. But the unique thing about mesoscale convective systems when they're mature is they still they tend to generate these unique flows and features that you just don't see with individual storms. Most importantly is this descending rear inflow that occurs on the back side of the storm. This particular air can be very, very intense. And once it sinks to the ground at the leading edge of the storm can be very, very intense. And we think, at least for most of the warm season derechos, we think that this is a, a marker or a cause of most of the extreme damaging winds that we see within these systems. So kind of a climatology of MCSs. Uh, this is very important, by the way, not just from a damaging wind standpoint, but because most of these events produce our rainfall. There is growing. Your, your screen has gone back again. Sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll just kind of pop in time to time to let you know. Yep. Well, let me see here. Let's do this. Again. Walker, would those, would those uh, winds come from the opposite direction? Oh. So, um, as, as, yeah, they, and I'll show you a radar perspective. They, let's say that most convective systems move from the west to east in the United States. Um, not always, but generally that's the motion. The rear inflow jet comes from the west and goes to the east into the backside of the storm. Okay. Um, it, whereas the, the inflow into the storm goes up and over the top of that. So you got these kind of 
uh, uh, coexisting but opposite direction airflows within these within these thunderstorms. Um, so, yeah. sorry about that. So back to the climatology, we're interested in, in the climatology of MCSs and QLCS, just showing you the overall number of events that we get over here on the left, um, you know, the Midwest and down into the Southern tier, we get 40 or 50 of these events, uh, MCSs per year. And as I was alluding to that, it's very important in terms of rainfall production because most of our, our beneficial rains during the growing season come from these convective systems. So this is actually one of the things we're doing is trying to assess in the future, how many are we gonna see fewer or, uh, or more of these events? Um, and what we're finding is that we're gonna dry out in the, in the Southern Plains and in the High Plains and see more of these into the Midwest, um, but greater variability into the future with these. Um, linear convective systems, again, we see these dominate across uh, the Ozark Plateau, Southern Mississippi Valley, Central Mississippi Valley, and Ohio Valley. So pretty much the heart of, of the kind of Eastern two thirds of the United States is, is the dominant um, area where we see these. You see upwards of 16 linear convective systems across parts of Mississippi and, and also Oklahoma and Southern Kansas. But just because we have a QLCS or a linear convective system doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get a derecho. I'm highlighting here the variability. We've looked at this historically. This is what we call a cumulative frequency diagram. So um, if we sum up historically how many QLCSs we've had over a given year, we sum this up. What you see is that most of our QLCSs occur in that April, May, and June, July timeframe. Um, that's where that slope is the greatest, and that's where we're really accumulating a lot of these events. On average in the United States, we see about 139 of those. And you can see over the right, the seasonality of this. Most of our QLCSs are April, May, and June. And for my back of the woods here in Northern Illinois, we could expect most of our QLCSs in June, July, and August. And sure enough, that's, you know, when I look, when I wanna go shelf cloud chasing, I just wait for June, July, and August. And uh, typically I'll get a lot, I got more shelf cloud pictures than anybody ever needs. So if you need a picture of a shelf cloud, just let me know. Speaking of shelf clouds, these are a variety, a type of Arcus cloud, which is a low horizontal cloud formation associated with the leading edge of the thunderstorm outflow. And a couple of images here uh, below is a, a roll cloud, or the top part here is a roll cloud. A roll cloud is a type of Arcus cloud that's actually detached from the, uh, from the thunderstorm. Um, and I'll show you an animated GIF here in just a second, which will cause it probably to go pixelated again. Um, the shelf cloud, which is usually the thing that, that most people just kind of are in awe of, is, is um, quite frequent ahead of these, these QLCSs as, as well as derecho producing convective systems. Although I've had some derechos move through the Midwest that I've tried to go out and photograph and it's just so hazy, so the dew points are so high. Some, some days here in the Midwest, we can get dew points in the low to mid eighties. You just can't even see the shelf cloud coming in. Um, you literally have to wait for the outflow to come by to finally get a picture of the thing. It's, it's, it's really a remarkable event that you can get when the dew points get so high here in the Midwest. Um, but the shelf cloud is a very kind of uh, telltale marker. If, if, if there's anything like I'm having a picnic or I got, you know, uh, some uh, people out on a ball field, I see that type of cloud, I need to take shelter because usually that means damaging winds are coming. So here's an example, and I'm sure it's, Henry, let me know if it gets pixelated after this, but this is an example of a roll cloud. Notice how it's detached from the actual thunderstorm itself, moving across the Nebraska landscape. These turn into outflow boundaries and are very important for instigating more thunderstorms down the road. Here's a shelf cloud across the Mississippi River. Um, they can be really dramatic. And uh, in this case, this actually had a tornado warning ongoing. You see the boats trying to take shelter at the last second here before the damaging winds get going. This is a shelf cloud at 530 in the morning across my campus. So there's a reason why I have a webcam system set up so I don't have to get up at 530 to snap pictures. It does it automatically for me, but shows you the, the dramatic views that you can get. Are we pixelated, Noah or Henry? No, we're, we're good. Wow. So all these shelf clouds, should people be afraid of or, or concerned about being under a shelf cloud or is it behind that where the, so if, I, if I'm under a shelf cloud or see one coming, do I, do I take shelter right then or do, what, what, would, what would you suggest to people? I would suggest it's mother nature's warning siren. It's, it's visually mother nature's warning siren to, to take some shelter. Um, yes, it is a hallmark of, of potentially damaging winds. Not always, but it's a good, good case of, like, ooh, that's an interesting cloud. Now it is not tornadic. 
Um, you know, these are outflow winds where the winds are gusting out, uh, like we've talked about, doesn't necessarily mean uh, um, that we're going to have any sort of tornado. Uh, but most people, a lot of people do call these in as tornadoes. Uh, clearly, that's not the case. You can see the outflow pushing out ahead of these. Um, but yes, when I see this, I, I take pictures and then I hit shelter. Um, that's usually what I do. But here's one more a dramatic one uh, across South Dakota. This is a, one of those cases of where, Henry, as I mentioned, a, a washing machine. If you find yourself in the backside of this outflow, you're going to be in for a, a heck of an event. And so um, if I saw this coming at me, I would be taking a lot of shelter very quickly. Are we still pixelated? Are we pixelated? No, we're good. Oh, remarkable. So this is speaking, Henry, of the, on the backside of the, of the shelf cloud, um, oh, you get just drunk again. So here, I think we're going to get, yeah. What's that? Every time your picture gets small, we get pixelated. So it just went small again. Okay. <laughs> Let me try again here. That's a precursor. Uh, that's the, that's the shelf cloud of, uh, of, uh, the presentation. No one's coming. Well, let's see here. Let me stop share again and let's do this again. These images are jaw dropping. I am yeah, loving they, uh, these, these images, even if it, makes it pixelated afterwards but yeah uh -oh. fantastic yeah, that guy. where is this where is this where is this one from this is actually in colorado out near flagler oh yeah uh it's a, a it, you can see i-70 right there um down on the bottom left but this yeah. is a, the example behind the shelf cloud this is what we call a whale's mouth so it's kind of like you're looking out of, of moby dick right you're looking out of the whale and, behind the shelf cloud and sometimes you get this very turbulent motion this rolling over um, it can be, again, ap ap apocalyptic looking. It's really a remarkable sort of thing. You don't always get these views or perspectives, but, but sometimes it can be quite dramatic like you're seeing here. So are we pixelated? No, we're good. Uh, what, on that last image, would you experience a lot of, a lot of wind with that as well? Or is that yeah. just... Yeah, yeah. It, 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 uh, yes. You, it, and, and it starts spitting on you too. A lot of rainfall is, is not far away. Um, this is the tail end of the, of the outflow, so I'm kind of at the southern end of the outflow, whereas if I was further north, um, I would have been in the damaging winds already. Um, so I kind of strategically pushed myself to this location so I could get a better view of, of the backside of the storm. Um, so we go back to the definitions here of Fujita and Wakimoto, this top family of downburst clusters, and this is what we are looking for in derechos. And actually the term derecho comes from the 1800s. It was coined by Gustavus Henrichs in 1888. And he was an Iowa physical scientist and you can see his quote over here to the right. He was really upset about papers out of New York City and whatnot, suggesting that Iowa was being ravaged by these big tornadoes all the time. And he knew that wasn't the case. There were certainly tornadoes, but he, he, he noticed that there was probably a lot more just damaging wind that wasn't tornadic. And so he came up with a term derecho, which is a Spanish derivative meaning straight ahead or direct in correspondence with the word tornado, which its derivative comes from tornar, which means to turn. So all the way back to 1888, we had this term that most people still can't get to right to this day, but it actually took another hundred years or so for Bob Johns the late Bob Johns, who used to, to be at the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, who just died uh, two years ago, I believe. Um, but he is the one who came up with the modern criteria for, for derechos. And I give you some of the specifics down in the bottom. The main thing is that we have to have a swath of damaging winds produced by a long-lived thunderstorm complex or system that has temporal and spatial continuity. That is the entire swath is produced by a singular thunderstorm system. And so the, the kind of the hardest thing to get in this criterion is that 240 miles or longer in the axis length. And that, that's somewhat of an arbitrary, it's 400 kilometers, very arbitrary, but you have to slice and dice somewhere to classify mother nature. And it just so happens to be that we're looking for the, the, the most expansive and longest lived of these events. And those are de defined by this, by this derecho definition that Bob Johns came up with. And his definition was actually based on Fujita and Wakimoto's family of downburst criteria, which we've seen before. So I'll show you a kind of summarize of what a derecho is. It's, you know, 
for lack of better, you know, we're not getting too far in the weeds. It's a particularly long lived, widespread damaging windstorm produced by a mesoscale convective system or MCS. It's made up of a family of downburst clusters. And it, it, kind of the critical thing is it must be have a damaging swath of about 240 miles or greater. A lot of these events, you know, have damaging swaths nearing uh, 800 miles or so. They can be quite expansive. And the two primary dangers with derechos are the duration of the damaging winds and the widespread coverage. So it's not just a little outflow that comes through for two or three minutes. Many derechos, particularly in the Midwest and in the warm season derechos, have extreme damaging winds that can last for you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes. Um, let me give you a couple of examples or what we call classifications of derechos. There's the kind of cool season or transition season. So you would see this maybe in October through April, maybe May. These are typically called serial derechos. And these occur with big extra tropical cyclones with an expansive cold front. And they produce a cold front, uh, excuse me, a squall line of thunderstorms that can have very, uh, usually they're not that intense. You know, you can have 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. Um, but they don't tend to last as long as, as what I'm going to get ready to describe, which are the progressive derechos. So the serial derechos are much more of a cool season, big extra tropical cyclone or low pressure with this expansive cold front that just kind of plows into an unstable environment and can produce a large swath of damaging winds. They're a nightmare for aviation because they're so expansive. They can literally stretch from Detroit to New Orleans. And it's like, how do you fly through, you know, send, send intercontinental uh, aircraft? Uh, it's, it's a very problem, big problem for aviation. And then we move into progressive derechos. These are the ones that are kind of the, the poster child for derechos. These are typically our, our warm season phenomena. Um, typically we'll have a bow echo uh, appearance, um, kind of a surge in the reflectivity like you're seeing here across the, the piney woods of, of East Texas and uh, very fast moving. In fact, most of these uh, move at highway speeds. So you can be chasing this, and unless you have an interstate that, that go, has a speed limit of 80, 85 miles an hour, it's going to overtake you. Progressive derechos have a tendency to be very, very fast moving, and their translation speeds are one of the most kind of, uh, um, in terms of societal impacts, can ca catch a lot of people off guard, particularly aviators and boaters. Um, unfortunately, uh, um, a lot of times will we'll find themselves in dangerous uh, uh, situations with these events. Walker, so, let, me, let me ask you, are those uh, the progressive ones? Do you find those mainly at night or late afternoon? Or what, what is the time of day where you would see? Because I can imagine one coming at night would really take people by surprise. Yeah, so the interesting thing with warm season progressive derechos is they have a tendency to be nocturnal, which means they occur at night. Now, as we know with Mother Nature, just because I say they have a tendency to occur at night doesn't mean you can't have one at noon. Um, but if you look at the climatology, the peak is usually, you know, late evening through 1 or 2 a.m. is when the peak intensity for most of these warm season progressive derechos are. And so that does present a, a warning problem, right, of getting the word out before people go to bed. Um, but a lot of the upper Midwest kind of classic derechos have, uh, have occurred during the overnight hours. Do, do they, is there such thing as a derecho warning that the Weather Service uh, issues? Uh, no, there, there is not. not, but they are moving towards a, um, much like we have tornado emergencies, we've had those for going back to May 3rd, 1999, uh, the Weather Service is moving towards a, a heightened wording for a severe thunderstorm warning, um, and so hopefully that will work with local community sirens and, and alert systems to trigger additional warning and heads up. Because what we found is that, that with our severe thunderstorm warnings, there's a lot of um, complacency. Uh, people just don't tend to pay attention to them. And in these particular severe thunderstorm warnings, you do need to pay attention. Um, uh, so there isn't a derecho warning, um, unfortunately, but uh, there is extreme damaging wind uh, criteria now that the weather service is implementing in their severe thunderstorm warning. Because it could, it could seem like when you get a severe thunderstorm warning, we, they're hit and miss a lot of times. It may not hit your county or your area where these look like you're going to get it no matter yep. where you are along that line. So, And this is uh, where the weather service often what we call carpet bombs. The warnings tend to be very expansive, so they'll stretch across multiple counties. 
Um, and, it, and, and the thing is, a lot of times you have to issue these warnings because of their translation speed. Sometimes you'll look at the radar and you're like, that storm's oh, 40 or 50 miles away. Why am I under a severe thunderstorm warning? Because it's going to be there in 15 or 20 and moves that quick. And so there's all sorts of warning issues with these particular events because they move so fast. But I'm showing you some of, uh, um, speaking of, of Ted Fujita, uh, one of the things he, he spent a lot of time studying was Boeco. In fact, the terminology Boeco comes from, from his, uh, his nomenclature. And so we see these storms, oftentimes these progressive derechos have that rear inflow that I've talked about um, surge in on the backside. And that is a primary source of the extreme damaging winds. Um, I mentioned this one to Henry the other day, the super derecho, so I had to throw it in. This is the most unique derecho that I've ever seen. Uh, this is May 8, 2009. By the way, a well-forecast event. Remarkably, it just shows you how expansive these events can be, right? Traveled 1,300 miles in 22 hours. So notice that it didn't have to take a bathroom break or stop for gas. These things just go and go and go and uh, can be very, very expansive. Here's a radar depiction showing you the development in northeast Colorado, and then finally the dissipation uh, about lunchtime near Charleston, West Virginia the next day. So it shows you, again, peak intensity typically in the overnight hours as we see across uh, uh, Kansas and, and Missouri. So there has been some, some definitional concerns, and one of the things that's a couple of people down in Norman, Oklahoma at the Storm Prediction Center and the National Severe Storms Laboratory have, have tried to tighten the definition um, for derechos to much more fit the warm season progressive. So to throw out the serial derechos and just allow that derecho definition to be used for, for just those warm season progressive. Um, their, their reasoning behind is that the most intense events tend to be affiliated with these rear inflows. And rear inflows don't tend to occur with serial derecho events. They only occur with the progressive events like you're seeing here. And you can almost see the radar surging out in the bow echo that damaging wind is really at the heart of that arrow as that surges out um, uh, towards the Quad Cities in this case, They're actually heading towards my house in about an hour back in the day here. And uh, Henry, I mentioned this, the, the kind of the radar depiction. Now, those of you that don't know velocity, this is, this is kind of quite Greek to you, but uh, those of you that know a little bit about radar, we can actually determine the, the motion of particles in, in the atmosphere using Doppler radar. And the reds indicate uh, winds moving away from the radar and the greens towards the radar. In this case, the reds are, are moving very intensely away from the radar and surging down towards the ground uh, in the lower part of the atmosphere. This is the leading edge of the bow echo and the rear inflow, what we call rear inflow jet uh, that surges down to the ground and gives you the extreme damaging winds in, in most of these progressive events. So we talked about climatology. If you look at all derechos, um, the, the kind of the peak is across the Ozark Plateau into the Midwest in the Southern Mississippi Valley in Northeast Texas. But if you look at just the warm season, which by the way is when most derechos occur, as you can see in the bar chart in the top right, um, the warm season progressive derechos are, are kind of, there's a little highway of derechos, if you want to call it a derecho corridor that stretches from Minneapolis down into to central Ohio. I'm excited about this because I live in the pixel with the most progressive derechos of anywhere probably in the world, and that is in northern Illinois. So we see a lot of these events around our backyard here, um, and um, we're quite familiar with them. And we get a lot of damaging wind events. Even this year, I've had damaging wind in my neighborhood um, twice already. And uh, uh, so we're quite familiar with these particular type of events. I don't have time, and this might create quite an issue for Noah on the background, but I have a link down here at the bottom. You see this hyperlink? Um, hopefully you can jot that down real quick. This video goes for 45, uh, 30 minutes. And this is from the derecho last year. And I love this video because it shows the longevity of intensity of derecho. So this is out of Cedar Rapids. Walker, can you mute the uh, video? Sure. Um, so, sorry about that. So you said that it starts to get a little windy. And we'll click through, and you already got some tree limbs down. Um, and it starts to get, oof, now this is getting pretty bad, right? Now we're six minutes into the video. Stretch a little bit further to eight minutes. Now you see all the tree damage. You think it's done, right? Nope, we still got another 18 minutes or so of damaging winds. And so as I said, that the kind of the, the issue with 
derechos is not necessarily just the intensity of the wind event, but the longevity of the wind. It can, it's almost like being in an eye wall of a hurricane, of a, a moderately intense hurricane uh, that can last, you know, half an hour or so for some of these events. So you Walker, see- when, when these come through, so I know for a tornado, people take a shelter in the basement or storm cellar, safe room. What is, what, what would you advise? So just get in the house, get away from windows. What, what kind, I mean, it looks pretty intense, but I, is it's, it's not tornado uh, type winds or it could be, but uh, what, what yeah. would you suggest for people that when they see a warning come out for this? You, you got to take shelter. Um, guess what? Trees f- fall in tornadoes and they, and they, and they fall in, in damaging winds, non tornadic but, but I mean, shelter as far as go down the basement or go into the basement, or if you don't have a basement, the interior part of your house, uh, particularly a, a bathroom or a closet. Bathrooms are great because of the plumbing uh, tends to reinforce the walls a little bit. Okay. Um, those that have, you know, one of the aspects of research that I'm not going to talk about today that we do a lot of research on is mobile homes, manufactured housing. Uh, in those cases, you need to be out of the housing structure before the wind is even there. You need to find shelter. The thing we struggle with in the South is that there's not a lot of, of shelters uh, for people to go seek shelter to. Um, so there's a, a disconnect and vulnerability down in the Mid-South and, and other parts of the Midwest uh, where we uh, so particular vulnerable people tend to take the brunt of these storms. And these seem like they move quicker than a tornado. So coming in, is that correct? That, that, that you know, have less probably time to react or to get right. into shelter, right? On average, on average, uh, derechos move much faster than tornadoes. Now, there can be some wild cards with tornadoes moving 60, 70 miles an hour. For instance, the infamous tri-state tornado in 1925 moved about 60 miles an hour. Um but damage derechos have a tendency to move very fast during the warm season. Like I said, highway speed, if not better than highway speed in most cases. So yeah, you bring up a good point that you need to, as we find we're, we're social people, we tend to always try to confirm a warning visually or via sound. So it's natural for a human being to try to confirm what's going on with their hearing. Uh, unfortunately, people find themselves in trouble when they, when they do that. Um, so I'll tell you to try to verify, but always listen to the warnings and do as instructed because you just never know. It's kind of like we, with warnings, I liken it to be when you get into your car today, you should put on your seatbelt. Now, the likelihood of you getting in a wreck is pretty small, but you put on that seatbelt just in case. And you have to think of warnings like this as well, um, that just in case it's my time, my house takes it, um, I need to, to take shelter. So you can see that this is still going on. I, I mean, we could watch this. It's, it's really remarkable video. It just shows you just the, the extreme longevity and intensity of events, uh, the, 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 the winds that can occur with derechos. And we see these aerial- flattened and we see stuff. How about houses? Are, do, does this, will these flatten a house as well? Or Not a well-built stick home. Um, okay. Most of the damage you'll see with a derecho would be in the EF0 to EF2 range. So we're talking... 60 to 110 miles an hour, uh, uh, but but you a lot of roofs, a lot of uh, siding, uh, a lot of walls felled, um, but you don't see the intense destruction that you would get with a say an EF4 or EF5 tornado. Um, that said, mobile homes, manufactured houses are often destroyed at 115 miles an hour. So that's an equivalent of an EF2 tornado. And you did mention that sometimes tornadoes are embedded in these these bow echoes with the duration. So you really need to take shelter, sure. Yes, and that's one of the things that we find a lot of times, um, particularly again with the warm season events is they have embedded circulations that can produce tornadoes. Um, And we're just, we're getting about 10 years worth of data where we can, with our high resolution Doppler radars now, we're starting to build kind of event climatology of that where, you know, prior to 2009, we didn't see a lot of those. They, they were just below our resolution and our capability. But now we know that these are far more common. And so indeed, derechos can have embedded tornadoes within them. Um, here's a ex- couple of examples of the extreme damaging winds that occurred in the Boundary Waters derecho uh, back on July 4th. If there's any day that tends to get a lot of derechos, it seems to be July 4th. <laughs> Uh, not every year, but it seems like that's the year that, that the date of the year that, that where we get uh, a lot of events historically. 
So where does the damaging, the source of damaging winds? First off, when, when air falls through a, a sub, uh, an area that doesn't have cloud, you're in an area that, that's less than 100% relative humidity and the raindrops and the snowflakes are either gonna evaporate or what we call sublimate. The evaporation and sublimation processes are actually cooling processes that cools the air. And you've all felt the outflow from a thunderstorm and know that it's quite cool. Well, cold air is dense and it sinks to the ground and splashes out. And that's, that's a primary driver of most of the microbursts and macrobursts that we see, including some of the damaging winds within derechos. I've mentioned the rear inflow jet. This seems to be the, if there's one thing that we're looking for to determine whether we're just gonna get a few microbursts or we're gonna have a derecho, um, it seems to be the rear inflow jet. It seems to be the key to turning on the extreme damaging winds for such a long swath. And then finally, I've, I've mentioned the tornadoes, but, but, but you can actually have embedded supercells or area of rotation. And I'm showing you a case. If those who have a, a good discerning eye can look in, in, right along the Savannah River here. We're, we're, pixelated. Zoom in. we're pixelated again on that last shot. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Let me stop again. Yeah, that's frustrating, isn't it? Okay. So hopefully not too pixelated. Well, Looks good. Looks good. I don't know, I've lost my anime. Oh, there we go. So this is an extreme damaging wind that actually had a supercell embedded. Went right, back the to, went right back to pixelated, sorry. Okay, this one might be problematic because it's such a large image, but the point is to kind of show that we can actually have rotating thunderstorms in the line and they can produce uh, not only extreme damaging winds, um, but, uh, but tornadoes as well. So let me go back here, let me move forward one. And these extreme, These uh, kind of very narrow swaths of extreme damaging winds affiliated with these kind of embedded supercells can create these swaths of, of damage. And I, I'm bringing up the Adirondack State Park from, from the derecho that went through there in 1995. And you can see that the entire park is not mowed down by trees. I mean, the trees aren't mowed down. There's long we lost, skinny- we lost it again, sorry. Long skinny swaths of- um, and for what it's worth, I'm the last two times it, it it had not pixelated on my end, but but yeah, it's probably pixelating on others too. So okay. it is weird. I'm sorry that this is happening. So are we better now? It looks yeah, good on my good. end. Yep. Yeah, we're fine. Oh, okay. and it just went back. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna. How about I skip forward? How are we pixelated? Yep. Yeah, Henry, I can it's see on it. The screen for some reason. Yeah, that's. All right, let me try to get all have such great graphics. We want people to be able to see them. So how about now? Uh, we're good. OK, I, I, will, I will stay off the animated gift. The, the point is that that we can have these big squall lines or bow echoes coming at us. But it's usually very, you know, let's call them 10 to 15 mile wide little corridors or, or kind of snake like um, areas where we see these, these swaths of extreme damaging wind. And usually those are affiliated with rotation within the line. Um, so it's almost like a supercell is embedded within the linear convective system. So I wanna turn my attention real quickly to the, eight, the August 2020 event um, to kind of give you a sense of, of, of the scale of this event, uh, because most people haven't heard about it unless you lived in the area. Uh, this is on par with the April 27, 2011 tornado outbreak in terms of cost. Um, it's, if we think about Hurricane Ida, it, the estimates now are that that storm will probably cost $18 billion or so. This particular event is, is on for about $11.5 billion and nobody really talked about it. Uh, so you see how, how, you know, not only damaging, but deadly these events can be. Um, this unfortunately also killed some folks, but even with good warnings out, extremely devastating for the Corn Belt in terms of, of the crop losses that we had. Um, so let's look at this event and hopefully I won't pixelate too much, but this is the swath that started in South Central South Dakota early in the morning and it moved through uh, uh, Iowa at peak intensity during the lunch hour and into my neck of the woods about 3 p.m. and then over into um, Ohio, Northern Indiana later on that evening. 
Uh, I'm sure I'll get pixelated here, but uh, this is the radar animation showing you the e evolution of the bow echo and the damaging wind reports across the Midwest. I'll let that play through and you guys yell at me if, uh, if I've pixelated again. Are we pixelated? No, that looked good. Okay. You're fine. So this is an illustration of just all the corn. If you've never been to my area of the woods, I look out my back window and actually this year I have soybeans. Um, but we are surrounded by corn. Um, in fact, this time of the year, it feels a little claustrophobic because the corn is so tall and you can't see anything. But we are the dominant producers of corn for the world and uh, as well as soybeans. And, and this event went right through the corn belt, as you can see with the, the damaging winter ports. And notice the little triangles as well. The red triangles are very, very close to my home here. We had a number of tornadoes across the uh, uh, Chicago area um, affiliated with this event. Indeed, this is the radar animation as it left my house and moved towards Chicago. And, and for those, again, with, a, with an ability to look closely, we'll notice the little kinks in the line. And those are the areas of rotation that went on to produce tornadoes across the Chicago area. So we think of these as lines. Sorry. Uh, we think of these as lines. Um, in fact, I'm going to move forward here. Um, but they can have little kinks in them, a little, little areas of uh, rotation. And that's where we see the extreme uh, uh, damaging winds as well as potential for tornadoes within this. Some of the aftermath, are we okay on pixel? We're good. Okay. You can see the flattened corn crop. Um, this is where- oh, just, jump back, just jump back, sorry to keep interrupting. Okay. Yeah, about, Henry, about I'm not sure what I'd almost like to do a raise of hands from from the audience. We got 200 people, but I, I it's been looking good to me the last. Okay, if, you, four if you're times. still good, then that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. Noah, you yell at me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, people, a few people are raising hands, but I, I it's it's yeah. something it, it, just to make sure there is a button to click to optimize for video that might be. Yeah. Yeah, you're trying that, so. Yeah, it's just optimized for video clip. I'm, I'm yeah. doing that uh, and share sound. So uh, I'll tell you what. It, it's, it, you know, it seems to be happening just before your video clip comes on, so. Yeah, it's something to do with the uh, animated GIFs. How are we now? It looks it, good on my end. It was good, and then it went small again, but go huh. ahead. We're, if How it's good now? for knowing, we're, 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 we're okay. Yeah, we're recording this, but hopefully it's coming through good on my screen, and. Well, for those of you that uh, want to look for an uh, internet service provider, uh, I have Comcast, so maybe uh, <laughs> let's. I will skip forward here. Let me see. Share screen. Let's see. It's weird that it's jumping on Henry's screen too, where it makes it smaller for whatever reason. That is not happening for me too. the The last thing we'll try, Walker, is maybe to turn off your camera, but um, this looks good to me right here. Okay. Well, the, the big losses were in the Cedar Rapids area and most of the, and by the way, I drove through this area, um, you know, about a month or two ago and, and the devastation is, is really quite immense um, across the Cedar Rapids and Marshalltown areas. Uh, the crops have come back, but all the trees and uh, a lot of the, you still see a lot of blue roofs, which is where tarps are on top of the roofs. Uh, so there's still expansive amount of damage and still recovery going on in, in the central and eastern parts of Iowa. Uh, this shows you the, the radar depiction indicating kind of the surges of outflow and where the most extreme damaging winds were. Again, on the leading edge of the bow echoes and even where you have those little kinks in the radar reflectivity. Um, those are where we tend to get the most uh, extreme. Henry, how are we doing, man? Is it pixelated? We're looking, we're looking good, but I'm going to keep quiet. I'll let Noah be the, the lookout <laughs> on this. I tell you what, uh, I don't. We're running long, but I don't want to necessarily go into the climate change aspect if, if we have a lot of questions specific to duration. You know what? Let's let's go long, and if there's questions, okay. uh, we can do them offline. I think the presentation okay. is is an important part. We'll we'll take uh, probably ten questions at the end if we can okay. limit that today. And but I apologize we, for the pixelation. It's 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 one of those. Uh, it's a great great presentation. We're enjoying it. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I always get asked is climate change to blame. 
uh, for this event. And I don't think anybody has probably had the ability to not turn on the news in the last week or two and seen this question raised. Um, whenever we have an extreme event, uh, you know, the questions, it's a natural, I get the questions from my own children. Um, you know, they, they see this sort of stuff and they, they want to know, they hear a lot of the, uh, the talk about climate change and how things are, are occurring. And I'm not here to debate climate change. I think hopefully you can do your own research and find out that it is indeed occurring. Uh, um, but we have to be real careful in blaming um, particular events, uh, disasters on climate change. What we need to think of it is, is it a contributor? Um, so the way the media portrays a lot of times is this event was caused by, by climate change. And really what happens is, is climate change is contributing to the intensity or, or lack there of intensity of extreme events. Um, so there's a lot of research going into what we call attribution science. And attribution science is really novel and new. It's, it's only been around for 10 or 20 years in, in any sort of uh, robust way. And um, I'm excited to say that we do a lot of that here. We try to assess, um, but we look at it holistically. We look at how the physical events, such as derechos or tornadoes, might be changing, hurricanes and so forth, but also how society is changing. You know, how much growth we're seeing, uh, the building of neighborhoods, the, the more cars, the, you know, the lack of good infrastructure investment. All of that pays either good dividends or bad dividends down the road. And uh, so at NIU, we have a tendency to focus holistically on this problem because we, we are seeing more intense disasters. But disasters are, are caused by two things, and that is an extreme event, whether it be a weather event, a geologic event, a terrorist attack, co-mingling with society. Extreme events by themselves don't create disasters. It's extreme events mingling with society, uh, us humans in our built environment that create disasters. So this is a graphic looking at our, our understanding of particular perils and, and relationship to climate change. The point is that the events that I'm talking about today, particularly downbursts and tornadoes are not well understood when it comes to whether climate change is affecting them. Um, and whether we can say one way or the other, um, if the frequency or magnitude of the events are, are changing. That said, we're making a lot of strides. If we look historically at the data, we find that there's no clear trend in the annual number of tornadoes. And most of the focus on severe weather has been looking at tornadoes. The damaging wind record is so problematic and bad that it's very hard to deduce trends in, 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 from those data. There's been a huge inflation of reports, just mainly because there's more reports, not necessarily because of, of climate change per se. So overall, we're, we're, we're not that confident in changes, at least historically. Some work by my colleague, Victor Gensini and Harold Brooks um, have noted the, a, a, an eastward shift in the tornado supportive environments. In fact, uh, tornadoes are decreasing in, in, in frequency in the Great Plains and increasing in uh, um, frequency in the mid-Mississippi mid, mid Valley and in the Mid-South. And then there's an increasing clustering of tornadoes. Uh, it's decreasing days per year with tornadoes, but when we do have tornadoes, we have more of them. So some fascinating trends that we're finding. What we can do is use modeling, though, to assess the environments supportive of severe weather, whether it be derechos or tornadoes or hail. And we can, we can assess these ingredients for severe storms and see if they're changing. And that's the, what we call an implicit view of severe weather. And so what we do is we look at four ingredients, what we call slim, shear, lift, instability, and moisture. If these four ingredients come commingle, come together, we can have a severe storm. And so using numerical models, uh, for instance, we've run about 60 years of historical and future simulations um, on massive supercomputers. And it's taken us about a year to year and a half to run these simulations. Um, these are at 3.75 kilometer resolution, so very high resolution models um, that allow us to kind of look historically at extreme events, but also into the future under a warming regime. And so we can look at, at, at these ingredients and the hallmark is that we're gonna see more moisture, 
more instability, the question mark is shear and lift. These are the big question marks in terms of whether we're going to realize whether these, these storms are going to um, occur. The other thing we can do with such high resolution models is we can actually create synthetic tornadoes or synthetic wind reports or synthetic hail reports. And this is the really interesting stuff. Now, again, it takes huge supercomputing power. Uh, the totality of our data set is going to be probably about 500 terabytes. So you're, you're talking about a lot of data. And the hardest thing is not necessarily creating the data, it's processing the data and trying to figure out what's going on. But here's an illustration from my colleague, Victor Gensini, showing you purple, the purple little hatches there. Um, and hopefully we're not pixelated, are we? No, we're looking good on my end. Okay. Good here. Okay. Uh, the purple there is actually synthetic severe weather reports. And so what we're doing is, is, is simulating into the future under a warming pattern all the way out to the end of the 21st century. And then we're simulating historically to make sure that we capture the severe weather climatology. And we're just doing simple changes. Are we seeing more severe weather reports or less severe weather reports in the future? So this is the explicit view where we actually literally simulate the actual hazards themselves. So what is all of that huge amount of data telling us? And by the way, we're still processing. Um, a lot of our new results will come out in the next year. The model suggests that we're gonna see an increasing frequency of severe storm environments in the future. Now, just because you're seeing an increasing frequency of the environments, I'll put the caveat in there, doesn't mean you're gonna see a storm, but the environment supported the storm formation will increase. One of the things that most people don't talk about, but I think is the biggest thing with climate change is not just increasing frequency or magnitude of an event, it's the increasing variability. And you can see this particularly in, if you talk about Henry's backyard of Colorado, where you have these really wet years and then these really dry years and then extremely dry and extremely wet. And this huge, the variability that we typ that typify areas is getting bigger and bigger and bigger under a climate change regime. We expect an earlier season start, and that's one of the things that we're, we're very confident about. So rather than severe weather season starting in April, it's, it's gonna tend to start in, in earlier March, maybe even late February and running later. And then some great work by Jeff Trapp and Kim Hoogewin um, have found that there's possible increases in, in, in the most intense storms. So they've actually simulated individual storms historically, and then also under a climate change with more moisture, more heat, and they're more intense. There are some issues and concerns, and I hate, you know, Donna Rumsfeld, I think, passed away about a month ago or two, um, but he has this famous quote that, that there's some things that we don't know. Um, there's things, it's a lot of uncertainty, but you better believe that there are a group of scientists all around the United States and around the world trying to figure out what's going to happen here, because severe storms, as you can see, um, have dramatic impacts on society, and we need to understand um, how these events are going to change in the future. So I liken this to rolling the dice. On one hand, we know that there might be an increasing frequency, magnitude, and variability of, of derechos or tornadoes or hurricanes. But the other die is vulnerability, and that is humans. We have greatly expanded across the landscape. And this is some of the work that I've done with Stephen Strader. We've doubled our population. Our housing has increased well over 300%. We've gone from largely a rural population to urban and suburban development. Our urban footprint has increased by five times. And just simply, we've, we've escalated the number of people and things that are in the place in the way of these extreme events. And we can, just like we can simulate physical events like derechos or tornadoes or hurricanes in the future, we can actually simulate human beings and our development patterns. And so you can see a couple of examples of this, the development in 2050 and development in 2100, and just how much, how much more development that is urban and suburban, which is the red, orange, and yellow, that is in the way of tornadoes, of derechos, of droughts, of floods, of hurricanes, of whatever sort of hazard you can think of. And this is a leading problem for why we're seeing increasing impacts of disasters. And we call this the expanding bullseye effect. We have a singular tornado in this case, the little black snake there. And what you'll notice is over time, whether theoretical or the case of Wichita, Kansas, 
is more housing units or more people are impacted by the singular event that hasn't changed in terms of intensity or its placement. And so this expanding bullseye effect is a, some of our work that we've done on this with simulations is the, is the dominant reason why we're seeing an increase in impacts. But we're loading the dice. You know, on one side, we're loading the risk die, and on the other side, we're loading the vulnerability die. And so we have two of those things that are, that are becoming quite problematic. You might not hit snake eyes every time, but we're increasing the odds that we're going to hit it uh, more frequently in the future. So to summarize that, climate change may modify, and we've still got a lot of work ongoing. I hope in the next year or two, we'll, we'll have a lot more answers in terms of derechos, uh, I got students working on hail, uh, uh, just damaging winds event, uh, we, tornado, we got all sorts of stuff going on. Um, fire weather, uh, we hope to learn a lot more about the future of these events. But I remind you that, that impacts from disasters are really because of society and the way we develop, the way we build um, is leading to increased vulnerability and more exposure and thus more disasters as we move into the future. And you commingle that with more extreme events or potentially stronger events in the future. And uh, hey, we got what I call a recipe for disaster um, as we get more and more people that are unfortunately impacted by these events as we move into the 21st century. So I thank you, thanks for sticking with me. There's a lot more great information um, on the About Derechos page at the Storm Prediction Center. So if you just do a search for about derechos in Google, you'll come across the wonderful website that they put together. Um, and there's all sorts of, of nitty gritty details there on, on, on derechos if you would like to study a little bit more in depth about those events. But thanks for sticking with me for the troubles that we've had on the, uh, on the pixelations. I apologize for that. Thank you. Walker, thank you. Wow, what a wonderful talk. You know, makes me wanna go back to school again and, and take your class if, uh... If I was a little younger, I, I may drive out there to do that. But uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, really, really great stuff. We've got a couple of questions. We're going to take about 10 uh, questions here. If you're okay to stick with us for a couple minutes, we don't want to go too long. Um, but there's a, folks have been typing a few in. And so let, let's hit those real quick. Um, we've got a couple of folks wanting to know uh, Chris and Virginia and some others, Gail wants to know why uh, do states west of the Rockies not seem to be affected by derecho? So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, let me, um, hopefully I won't mess this up. Let's go back to my ingredient slide. Where was that? Um, when I talk about, let me do this again. Let's do a share. Oh, hold on just a second. Technical problems here, huh? All right, there we go. Um, so wonderful question, wonderful question. And it always comes back to when I talk about student, when I talk to students about forecasting any event, whether it be a blizzard or even blue sky, um, you have to think in terms of ingredients. And I know we talk about ingredients, I always bring, people talk about spaghetti or what are the ingredients for, for bread. I always like to think of the ingredients for a nice chocolate chip cookie. And so you gotta have sugar, you gotta have butter, you gotta have flour, you gotta have chocolate chips, right? If you're gonna make a chocolate chip cookie. And you know, they, people know the basics of, of creating a chocolate chip cookie unless you're lazy and go get the tube. But the same sort of stuff happens with weather phenomena. You're not gonna make a good tornado. You're not gonna make a good derecho unless you have the fundamental ingredients to get there. And the thing about the Western part of the United States is you just don't see the overlap of the four ingredients that we're talking about here that frequently. The main thing that you're missing is moisture and instability. And by the way, those two variables kind of commingle. Instability, I liken to think of is the gasoline in your gas tank. I hope that you're not driving right now, um, but, but, but I have gas sitting in my gas tank out in the driveway. It's not being utilized. It's potential energy. Now, as soon as I crank it up, that energy is going to be utilized. The environment also supports an a situation like that where we have gasoline in the environment. We have what we call instability. But just because you have instability doesn't mean you're going to be utilizing it. And so across the western part of the United States, you just don't see many days with high moisture content or with high instability. 
you can have all the shear in the world, all the lift in the world, but if you don't have instability and you don't have moisture, you're not going to get thunderstorm complexes and you're not going to get derechos. There are a couple of cases of derechos west of the Continental Divide. Uh, there was a famous one that went through Utah and into Wyoming oh, about two decades ago, um, but they're very, very rare. Great question. Sorry, I was on mute. Here we go. I've got another one here. Um, so Angie uh, from Cedar Rapids, uh, good question here. She wanted to know about, she said, you didn't talk much about lightning strikes and lightning mm. with these. Um, could you mention that? Uh, how much lightning? Where do you see that? Um, again, she was uh, she was affected by the, the, uh, the, the one in Cedar Rapids there. Back. Yeah. Oh man, I can tell you that that she knows all too well what can happen in a derecho. Um, that Cedar Rapids was particularly um, hard hit. Um, lightning with 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 warm season. So again, I go back to the progressive derechos. Uh, these events tend to have extreme amounts of lightning uh, efficiency. Um, most of the lightning, though, is behind the squall, behind the uh, the shelf cloud. So uh, kind of contradicts what you would see with most supercells. A lot of supercells, you see a lot of lightning out ahead, uh, downstream of the actual storm. Um, whereas most with the convective systems that we're talking about with the ratios, most of the lightning occurs in the, in the midst of the uh, uh, event, as well as behind the storm in what we call stratiform rain. Now, stratiform rain is a little bit different than um, kind of the intense thunderstorm rain that you, you might affiliate with a, with a storm. Uh, but these big thunderstorm complexes often have, and let me see if I can find an animation again, often have a big, oh, here we go. I don't know if that's working for you, but you can see the leading line, the high reflectivity, that's where the intense damaging winds are. That's also where your tornadoes are. Um, but they have an area of very light to moderate rain on the back side of them. And we actually see some really remarkable, what we call positive bolts on the back side of convective systems. Um, and that's one of the unique things with these, with these events. Now, that said, I gotta be careful because mother nature always loved to throw a, a, a curveball. Um, but just because I say that these have a lot of lightning doesn't mean that's always the case. Uh, but the tendency- Walker, yeah. Is that uh, cloud to ground mostly or in cloud lightning? In, in Both. Those? Both. Oh, okay. um, you see a lot of IC and, and um, um, uh, CGs. Uh, the positive bolts, the CGs that you get with these can, on the backside can be really cool, <laughs> quite cool to look at. Uh, but as you know, quite dangerous as well. Sure. Jackie writes in and she says they frequently have mematis clouds. Mm. Should we be concerned about microbursts from them? Could you explain oh. what that is to folks out there? And is there any concern when they see these mematis clouds? For the most part, mematis are harmless. Um, they're, they're really cool. I love mematis clouds. I got lots of time lapses of them. They kind of look like bubble wrap. When I time lapse them, they look like bubble wrap going across the sky. So they're not that interesting. But when you see them, they're dr quite dramatic and, and they're um, the only cloud that forms via downward vertical motion, which is really neat. Um, for the most part, they are, they're not dangerous. That said, I've seen mamatis in, in, in your neck of the woods, Henry, out in eastern Colorado a number of times, out ahead of supercells, not with MCSs, but with supercells um, that as they literally pop, uh, they sink in, in the air, they become little microbursts and they sink down to the ground. And uh, those can be particularly bad for aviators. And so if you've ever flown in and around thunderstorms uh, in the Denver area, uh, if you've ever had the luxury of flying into Denver in the middle of summer, um, you know that it can be a bumpy ride, especially when there's thunderstorms. So uh, I'll, I'll caution to say that most of the thunderstorm complexes that we're talking about today, the derecho producing ones, um, can produce mematis that are pretty harmless. Um, but you get these unique events out into the high plains uh, that can be, uh, that can produce actually microbursts all the way from the, the from the tropos, tropopause, which is the top part of the weather sphere, and they sink all the way to the ground. What a great question, and aviators need to watch out for those. Okay, we're going to take two more questions here. Here's one from Michael. Uh, early on, he wrote in, Michael from California, 
wanted to know are shelf cloud winds slightly ahead of at the leading edge of or just after the leading edge of the shelf cloud great question and once again i'm going to dodge it a little bit because it can vary um you know i had a shelf cloud come through my neighborhood three days ago and the winds hit exactly at the moment the shelf cloud came over the top but in a lot of instances i've seen the damaging winds hit me first i can feel the cold outflow before the shelf cloud is over the top of me so that is the leading, the surge of cold, dense air is actually out ahead of the cloud matter. So you gotta be careful with that, thinking that, oh, the shelf cloud is, is where I need to finally go take shelter, right? I'll just wait for it to come over my head. In some cases, it might be too little too late then. Um, and so you, you just need to be aware, weather aware, and keeping an eye on things. If you start to see the trees move ahead of you, right? Might be time to take shelter, but that's a great question and, and it just varies. But I would say based on my experience, most of the time it's right at right before the shelf moves over the top of you or right as the shelf moves over the top of you. Okay, actually, we're, we will take two more questions. I, there's okay. a, one that just came in here that um, Tommy, uh, our, our friend here in Staunton, Virginia, uh, Staunton, Virginia, wants to know what is the strongest recorded winds mm. from the ratio? Um, he thought he remembered 180 to 90 miles an hour. Is that... What, what, what do you have any records on that or that is a really really good question a lot of the extreme events that we've had across the midwest the anemometers have broken um so i can think back to the may 31st 1998 derecho that particularly hard hit for wisconsin and michigan i think the anemometer broke at 128 miles an hour um hmm. And I don't think we had any, there might've been some damage with the one that we had in August uh, last year. We just, I don't know if we have a great maximum wind gust. A lot of the extremes that you see are in the 120, 115 to 130 range. Um, but we lose a lot of our anemometers because of the debris. Um, so this is not like a hurricane where it's over the you know, ocean and, and you can get good assessments of wind speed without debris. Um, in this case, you have flying debris and the debris will take out the anemometer. It will break the instrumentation at that point because you have tree matter. Even a corn stalk moving in 130 miles an hour will do a lot of damage. And so I don't think we have great estimates. Um, we could get Doppler radar wind retrievals. Um, but I don't know anybody that's really done a lot of great work on that, at least winds just off the surface of, of a derecho. A derecho is a hell of a lot harder to chase than, say, a tornadic supercell. And most of our Doppler, mobile Doppler radar research has been on tornadic supercells. But that's a great question. And maybe you could spur some research uh, uh, down the road. There is an infamous event um, that wasn't a derecho, but it was a microburst. And those of you might want to look up this. Uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, Air Force One made a, a touchdown uh, at Andrews Air Force Base, a joint Air Force, Air Force Navy, I'm, I believe now. Um, at the time, it was Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, and literally about three minutes later, he, on the edge of the runway, he had 178 mile per hour gust from a microburst. So uh, that, that's an interesting event because historically it could have been quite significant. I believe it was in 1983. And Ted Fujita did some assessment of that event. It just shows you how dramatic winds can be within microbursts, not necessarily derechos, but within the microbursts themselves. Great question. One that I don't have a good answer for, unfortunately. I've got another question from a viewer, but I'm going to interject one in here. We just made me think about, you talk about chasing these. Um, is there, does the Storm Prediction Center or, or anybody put out a possibility of a derecho for the, the the forecast for them because it looks like they they're kind of surprise events from what i see so it's not like a tornado where there's a high risk today of that what what goes what's the rule or what's what's common for derecho forecasting so the storm prediction center usually within their wording okay um now you know the typical stuff that you see from the storm prediction center in the media is what we call the categorical outlook, which is right. a slight, you know, enhanced, moderate, high risk. Um, underneath that, you actually have probabilistic uh, for each hazard. And the one for a derecho would be looking at the probabilities of damaging winds. 
Okay. And so if you get 45% hatched, what we call hatch, which means significant severe weather threat, that, that usually indicates a possibility of a derecho. But usually the forecaster within their text, because each SPC forecast has text underneath it. Now, I bet a lot of our, our listeners today are, 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 have looked at those before. They're very technical, um, but you know what? They do nothing more than talk about ingredients for severe storms like we've talked about today. And what type of storm type? What kind of morphology? Because you can have all of those ingredients in place and get tornadic supercells, or you can have all those ingredients in place and get big convective system that produces a derecho. So knowing your morphology, I go back to what we said about an hour ago, knowing your morphology is the most difficult thing, in my opinion, in terms of forecasting severe storms right now. Predicting that is really hard. And unfortunately, one of the things that we really struggle with is derecho prediction. And we've always struggled with it. And I don't think we've made great strides in terms of improving that, to be frank. Um, at the same speed that we've made in, in roads with, say, tornado prediction. Most of the science has been dedicated to tornadoes and hail. Wind has just been this, uh, unfortunately, this peril that is actually the most common. It just doesn't, hasn't seen the same sort of light sh uh, shown on it as, as these other perils. But maybe in the future, we'll, get, we'll see it. You know, since we have a lot of folks from other, a few other countries uh, watching this today, and we'll be viewing this, uh, we did talk earlier in the week about where where do these occur around the globe. So I know we're running late, but I think this is probably a good good thing to bring up. Uh, could you quickly highlight places where these are also seen, not just here in in the, in the U.S. Well, I'm happy to say that the United States is probably number one in the world, um, not only for derechos, but tornadoes as well, um, and also significant hail. So we, we, we take, take the gold medal in all of those. Uh, what we can do is look at the ingredients around the world and where those tend to, to overlap. And what we see is areas of South America, um, uh, south of the Amazon, uh, it's, uh, are are particularly prone to, to these type of events, uh, not only in mesoscale convective systems, but they also have tornadoes, uh, uh, tornado producing supercells as well. Um, the most devastating derecho events are often in, in Eastern India and Bangladesh. So Southeast of the Himalayas, those are particularly impactful because of the lack of shelter uh, that many people have there. That is again, the vulnerability angle that I talked about earlier. Um, Europe, uh, has a lot of these, and we're starting to build a climatology of not only tornadoes there, but they're doing a wonderful job of building out a climatology of severe winds and hail. Uh, other places might be uh, uh, South Africa, um, and also the southeast part of Australia you might see some, some type of events like this, but uh, it tends to be the mid-latitudes in very specific spots where you get the overlapping of those four critical ingredients that I, that I talked about. And by far and away, the United States, Eastern two thirds of the United States has more days that are supportive of these events than anywhere in the world. Okay, so here it is our final question of the day. And again, thank you for taking your time to answer all of these. Uh, those that we haven't gotten to, uh, I'm gonna ask Walker if you could follow up in the next, there's only a few more questions out there, but. Uh, this one comes from um, Mary in Wisconsin, in Elko, Wisconsin. She had a double derecho on 719 of 19. I don't know if you know that one. Mm. Uh, she wanted to know, is that common? Uh, and, and she said it was terrible damage in the area. Have you ever seen these or, or um, just if you could speak on that? Mary, you're tugging at my heartstrings. This is some of my dissertation research. Uh, uh, a lot of my dissertation work was on on the climatology of derechos, building out a climatology of them. Um, and also looking, one of the chapters was looking at the repetitive nature of these events and what I call derecho families. And I, I borrowed the terminology from Ted Fujita who examined tornado families. Um, what we noticed is that certain supercells can produce multiple tornadoes and he called those tornado families. So indeed, you, you, you hit it. We want you in the warm season, um, I'm trying to remember my specific statistics. Uh, it's been 16 or 17 years, but um, I think once you have a derecho during the warm season, you have upwards of a 70% chance of having another one in the next two to three days. 
So it, it's, it just so happens to be, you know, what you have the, the ingredients that are supportive of a derecho. Just because you have a derecho storm system move through doesn't mean that those ingredients disappeared. The ingredients might sit there for, for a week or two and, and, and might be supportive of not just one or two derechos, but, but literally a handful of derechos across a, a specific region. Uh, this is more frequent in the Midwest and into the Corn Belt. Um, in our neck of the woods here in Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I have some, unfortunately, I haven't done a lot of work in that, in that area um, in the last 15 or so years, but she, she hit, the, hit, a, um, hit the nail there. And, and in that once you have one event, the likelihood of another one is actually pretty high during the warm season. Well, Walker, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. We'll be recording it for folks that have missed it today. Um, and again, we our, our big thanks goes out to you for really some really good stuff here. Uh, folks, as we close out today's program, we want to let you know about our next Weather Talk webinar, and that'll be taking place on Thursday, November 11th. Uh, it's all about ice accretion, so freezing rain, ice building up, and we'll have Jay Schaefer from Northern Vermont University, formerly Linden State, as our guest. You won't want to miss this one. We'll have the registration info information up on our website shortly. Uh, before I forget, when signing off today, please take the short survey that'll pop up on your screen. And so until we meet again, stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, this is Henry Regis for the rest of the Coco Ross team saying goodbye for now and wishing each of you a great rest of the week. Take care. Thanks again. <laughs>